let me ask you, you, one of the words you used was that somebody or perhaps several people respond, you're being too judgmental. And yet when I think about the Beatitudes, not that they're necessarily judgmental, but they call, they demand sort of a, a reflection on ourselves and where we're at and what we're doing. How did you, how did you retain that call mm-hmm. uh, and yet not be what they call judgmental? Well, I think that's why the confession is so helpful. When I do the confession at the end of each chapter, it's no longer about them, it's also about me. Okay. And it's about us together, and it's about us together as Christians wrestling with this, as Presbyterian women, right. wrestling with this, as people of faith, wrestling with this call together. Okay. You know, so that, that, that then pushes them beyond, um, well, she's saying that this is what we have to do, to, okay, this is how she re- wrestles with this, how do we wrestle with this? Right. And as I've gone around the country, and I've actually made something like 20 presentations of this yeah. study this yeah. year. Okay. So there are only 52 weeks in the year. That gives you some idea. <laughs> um, but as I've gone around the country with the study, um, in, in introducing it to the women, one of the things I've encouraged them to do is to think about this uh, in terms of where they are. And I had one woman get very despairing and saying that it's just too big, I can't do it all. And that's where the um, wonderful video by Wanga Ramathai was very, very helpful, the former um, Nobel laureate who just died. Okay. She has this wonderful story of the hummingbird in the movie Dirt, oh. where she talks about the hummingbird and the forest fire. And the hummingbird sees this big forest fire, and all the animals in the forest are looking at this huge forest fire. But what the hummingbird does is goes to the lake and takes a drop of water oh, wow. and puts it in its beak and goes and puts it on the forest fire and then goes back to the lake. And the elephant, with this great big trunk that can hold so much water, says to the hummingbird, what are you doing? Your beak is too small. You can't do anything to stop that fire. And the hummingbird says, I'm doing what I can. You know, and so one of the things I always tell these women, many of whom are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, I've right. met some in their 90s, right. do what you can. Right. And there's nothing so amazing as this group, this group of women in their 70s, you right. know, gathered with crochet hooks, making necklaces, which they then sell to raise money for people in Congo who are facing conflict because of the conflict minerals that we use to power our cell phones. Right. You know, or... Um, Selling baby blankets so the money can go to a neonatal institute. Right. These are women who are doing what they can. So right. this is really about who they are and, and what they're doing yeah. anyway. Okay. It's just, it's there to support them and to say, keep going. Yeah. Don't stop. Yeah. Just because you think you're retired. And it's also a word to the church to say, you've got to hear what these women are doing and you've got to follow them. Right. Because they're doing something of importance. They're following the gospel in some really significant ways. Right. Now, do you... Uh, you have a monthly blog that mm-hmm. you put out in connection with this. That's and, correct. Um, do you do you relate these stories? Do you, these more human stories to I connect? Do. Or, so, what is it mainly that you're talking about? The blog? But the monthly blog, I, I take one of the studies every month mm-hmm. because the way women generally use this is they do, generally use this as a monthly study. So they start in September or August, and they they go through May or June. Okay, it's about nine months. Um, so I'm taking a different one of the Beatitudes every month. Oh, okay. Um, and whatever is going on that month, I will try to relate it uh, to the Beatitude. Right. So December's blog will be, um, I think it's going to be Blessed and the Merciful. Okay. Um, and so I'm going to start with World AIDS Day, which is December 1. Yeah. Because that is the next big issue that we need to deal with. Right. You know, and... Bring that to the attention of the women, yeah. and then let and then there's always a place for them to respond. There's a place for them to send back comments. Some I've had some negative comments, mostly positive comments. I get to publish the ones, and I I don't think there's any comment I haven't published. Right, you know. Okay. So um, just give a chance. To, it's another way to get out, get it out to the right. church. Okay. You talked about not speaking in an academic voice, and you need to speak in a voice that could be understood by your readers. But uh, I'm looking through it. It's just a very interesting format that you have. You have uh, little icons that indicate uh, different directions you're taking. So an icon for historical sidebars, an icon for the Greek, and then the, the talk in between. How did you balance that, which seems to be going a little further, and I enjoyed, uh, with you know what everybody can understand? Well, I had a good editor. <laughs> Having a good editor helps. Yeah. Um, and so I, we had decided that certain things would be sidebarred. And as an editor, one part of her job is to look at the study and say, 
what do we need to explain for the women that they may not understand? Because right. she knows the, the people that she's dealing with, and she knows what they might and might not understand. Right. So that's part of her job. And, and you know, as I told them, you gave me nine verses. I'm a biblical scholar. You're going to get Greek. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I'm giving you the Greeks so that you better understand what's going on in the Beatitudes, not just to show off, but really right. to help you go deeper. Right. And so I, what I've heard from women is they really appreciate that because I'm not speaking down to them. Right. I'm yeah. not dumbing it down. Um, I'm just I'm trying to be as much of who I am as I can, but I'm trying to say it in a way that they get it. Right. Getting it for the audience, I often, often tell students here that one of the reasons teachers ask you to paraphrase something is because they want to know whether you can turn around and give it to your people in a way that they can. Exactly. Understand. So that's what you're doing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I wouldn't write it with this voice for the academy. Right. I could write this for the academy. It would be a very different study, and it would be much longer. Right. Uh, we're going to be showing this to, uh, by and large, a lot of people that are viewing this are part of the community here, young mm -hmm. students. So if you're talking to the men and women mm -hmm. here in this AUC community. Um, but you've talked about women crocheting and women in their 90s and 50s. I, I want to know why a young woman or a young man who is 17 or 18 or 19 mm -hmm. is going to, to gain mm -hmm. something from this. Well, you know, it's interesting. A few a couple of years ago, there was a big song on the radio that was constantly being played, Waiting on the World to Change. Mm -hmm. We're waiting, waiting on the world to change. A lot of old school hip hop and even current hip hop is a critique of the way things are. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Right. And a study like this raises the question, what are you going to do about it? What is it that you believe and therefore what is it that you resolve to do? Right. And you don't have to be 90 years old to read it. Right. In fact, one of the groups that's actively involved in the study is a group of Facebook women so they're not in their 90s. Yeah, right. <laughs> there are over 400 of them, and several of them are in the study. Oh, wow. And they're really involved in this, and they're beginning to ask, well, what is it that we can do in light of the study? How is it that we work our faith forward? The same thing is true with the 17, 18, or 19-year-old. I wrote this for Presbyterian women, but 17-year-olds could easily use the study. Okay. Absolutely easily use the study. And probably would find ways to use the study um, that would therefore lead them to engage in community action, to begin to critically and analyze their community and ask those same sort of questions. The questions I'm raising in here are the same sort of questions I ask my seminarians. Okay. It's just worded slightly differently. To have them not only engage the biblical text, but also engage the world in which they are called to preach. Right. You know, how are you going to preach to the poor if you don't know who the poor are? Right. If you've never looked at your own community and asked that question. It, let me ask you that then, because I would think that your teaching and who you are is reflected in how you write. So uh, you teach at the seminary. Are you, um, uh, you're teaching the Greek and you're teaching the context and the textual criticism and whatever else you have, but do you also involve uh, social activity? Are you urging them in that direction? Is that part of how you teach well, where I teach at school, oftentimes in class there'll be an op there will be extra credit options to do social activity. Uh -huh. While I was involved in his Alliance for Faith and Health before it closed, one of the options was always to go down to Common Ground and give a meal. Uh -huh. I, I have yet to find an organization that I want to pair up with for this semester, but as soon as I find one, I'll put that back in. I think service learning is very important. Uh -huh. I um, when I do Bible and um, the Bible and African Americans in the Bible, that class. Um, part of their job is to go into the community and do some observation right. of how the Bible is used in community to come back and then analyze it. Mm -hmm. But I think being out in the community and seeing what's going on is critical. And it's very easy, um, even more so at the seminary level than at the college level. But even at the college level, since so many of our kids drive cars these days, it's very easy not to know what's going on in the rest of the community. Right. Yeah. Because you get in your car and you go to your house, and without... Being inside your car or your house, all you can see is that particular bubble of friends. So you're never involved in the wider community that's really out there. Right. You know, my challenge is always take martyr for a week okay. and then come back and tell me about your theology. Oh, wow. You know, or just go for a walk once a day right. outside of the AU Center. Take the buddy. <laughs> right. And then come back and tell me about your theology because you can't talk about theology outside of what's really going on in the community. Right. You know. And what's really going on, Vine City is one of the most HIV-infected communities. It's high in drug abuse. We all know this. 
It's got a high violence level. It's got very, very low issues when it comes to education. You know, what does it mean to be the Ivy Leagues of the black community, the, right. the Spellmans and the Morehouses, the ITCs and the courts? What does it mean for us to be here in the midst of all of this and not affect change? There is a, an author recently, and we'll have the, it up on the screen, the title of the book and the name of the author, but he has written about the Rwandan church mm -hmm. and what happened in 1994 mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. the, and the idea that they were, uh, whether they were real Christians or Christians in name, that that whole uh, country mm -hmm. was largely Christian. And he had this critique that, that Christians come over there with their aid packages, Christians and uh, drilling for water and everything. Right. He said, it's fine. But what we saw in Rwanda was that there was no spiritual transformation. That's right. Of That's right. So how do you balance, um, right. which is really important, taking the martyr, going down and, and helping with the AIDS uh, sufferers with that there needs to be um, transformation? Well, I wouldn't call them AIDS sufferers because okay. some are not suffering. Okay. Um, some are actually living quite happily with HIV okay. because of the the impact of uh, immunoretroviral medicines. I think part of the reason I put the confession piece in there was to have people actually do the internal work. Okay. It wasn't just for them to go out into the world, but also to start. Then that's the reflection part of praxis, right? To stop and say, "What is it that I believe? Okay. What difference does that make? Yeah. For okay. me." That's the element. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, that, I, I really care about the spiritual transformation. I said to the women, I don't care if you don't remember who wrote this study. Right. I care if 10 years from now it's still making a difference in how you yeah. do your Christian walk. To get a little away from it, I know okay. that you've uh, got other projects in the hopper, so what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this last uh, Society for Biblical Literature conference, um, Fortress Press asked me to be one of the three editors okay. of an upcoming one-volume commentary on the New Testament. Oh, wow. So it will be the Fortress commentary on the New Testament. They're also going to do a Fortress commentary on the Old Testament okay. um, with Dr. David Sanchez and Dr. Cynthia Kittredge. So that is planned to come out in 2013. All right. um, also, Samea Studies, which is the SBL press, is putting out a book called Islands, Islanders, and the Bible. I'm one of the contributors and one of the editors oh. of that volume. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, I have already submitted a contribution to the New Women's Bible Commentary that will be coming out next year. Um, Sharon Rigby will be the editor of that, but I wrote Acts of the Apostles this time. So that's coming out. She's you very excited. <laughs> I have a husband. <laughs> We're very happily it's married. Thank right. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> We're very happily married. All right. I married a geek. What do you want? Uh, okay. He's got a PhD in computer programming. Uh, okay. We're busily, happily working. <laughs> uh, what I don't have is children. That's the difference. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, and then... Um, Baylor University Press and I are in serious conversations about a book I want to write called Sojourner's Truths, The New Testament is Migrant Writings. That's really the book I've been dreaming for the last few years, and that's the one that's, that's the next one on my list. I'm okay. finishing a book on James right now for Sheffield Phoenix, which will be part of a short introduction series. Okay. There'll be a book for each of the New Testament books, and Benny Lou is editing that whole series. My book will be on the Epistle of James. That's going to be done by the 15th of December because my mother comes on the 17th. Oh. <laughs> so it will be done before she gets here so I can spend time with my mother this Christmas. But then right. next year, looking at Sojourner's Truths, uh, starting, starting into that and yeah. just jumping in. That's really the book I've been dreaming for a while. Right. So. If I could ask you, you, you recently took a sabbatical, mm -hmm. right? And you've come back. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit about what it means to go on sabbatical? Is it... Does it restore you? Does it uh, give? Did 